Shalom. Chag Sameach. Just so you know, Sameach is the root of uh, Sheen Mem Het. So this is the SH phonetic, the M, and the I write it CX, which is uh, Sameach. Some books have an H with a dot under it, and some people write CH, as in Chanaka. But it's not a ch, ch it's a ch. Clear the phlegm, the rabbi taught me. <laughs> do, do what? Got to clear the phlegm. Well, if you, you could go back there. An interesting thing, I was looking in the dictionary, English dictionary about something, and I was looking for the word for sepulcher, sepulcher. And the het is a fence, and the sepulcher is a tomb, and it said that the word sepulchre was not only a fenced tomb area, but a low gravelly sound. Why would the English dictionary say the same word for sepulchre tomb is a low gravelly sound? And so what is a low gravelly sound? Have you ever taken a shovel and sunk it into a mound of gravel, or even take the shovel and drag it along asphalt? What sound does it make? How would you imitate it? the sound of the chet. So, much to some people's disturbance, I always write the letter CX, not CH or H with a dot, even though it's the eighth letter, which is our letter H, but I, just, just so you know, if you ever see anything I've written, it's CX, which is, which brings significant attention, because you read it, it's like, e it's almost like visually offensive, but it's offensive to think there's a tomb a grave, a sepulcher, right in the middle of the Aleph bed. But as we talked yesterday, Yeshua, the Vav man, put to the weapon Zion and thrown into the tomb Chet, and then Tet, the round rock, rolled in front of the tomb, and Yod, the, the Roman seal put on it to lock him in. It's all a prophetic picture of the crucifixion. The letters Hey, Vav, Zion. Hey, look! When, when Pilate said, Behold this man, Eke Homo. So, anyway, that, that's what that is. So, Chag Sameach, just for that, what, what that's worth, Chag is uh, He Gimel, which is the letters H G. Chag would be, excuse me, it's not He Gimel, it's Het. See? Or the Het Gimel, Chag. And that's where um, C X G, Chag, reading right to left. And that's where we get the English word hog, which is the beast that you slaughter for the feast. So hog is the feast. Certain wait, people. Uh, Certain people do. We don't, but you know. Yeah, I was going to say, wait. No, hog? I'm, just, I'm just making associations so that you can remember things. Anyway, what we're going to talk about today is Exodus 3. otherwise known as the burning bush incident. So, later this afternoon we'll do part two of this talk, in which case I will write out words from the sentences in Hebrew, and looking at each individual word, we'll discuss the hypotenuse, but before we get to that point, I want to discuss the reason for why I think this is significant. As we discussed, and this is the third session, as we discussed yesterday in the second session, using the word Melchizedek as an example, one translation says, oh, it's a spe special order, like a secret priesthood, or elite, not secret, elite priesthood. Another one says it's a a king, and the other one just says it's the name of the person, you know, just so for the record, you have to know that the translators can't even agree how to read Hebrew. That's why there's so many different Bibles. And to get publishing rights, you must change the translation. You can't just 
put a different cover and sell it. You can't borrow other people's interpretation. Every single translation you see, and there's, somebody said there's 80 of them, there's maybe more than that, but there's a bunch of them on the internet, they have to change stuff. A certain percentage has to be your own unique spin. So some people just change the word with a, uh, a synonym. And then they'll just pick various words that they don't think matters and change the synonym. So we were looking yesterday, we had the word written up here, patach, which is that which opens. And then we read that, well, it's a gate, it's an entrance, it's an introduction, it's, it's opening, it's understanding, or seeing something that's inside. What is it? Is it a noun? Is it a verb? If you don't care what the sentence is saying, because it's just blah, 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 you know, it's that old stuff, no one's going to scrutinize. So last night, we were looking at Andrew Hoy, talking about his numbers, uh, no, Exodus 26 to, through 30, and it and was describing the Mishkan, and it's like, oh gosh, all these facts and figures and numbers and pieces of wood and weights, and it, it, nobody looks at it, but he's a structural engineer, so he looked closer and he realized, wait a minute, the, the design of the Mishkan that we've always seen isn't what works? It's not practical. It, it, he's suggesting it's a circle, not a rectangle. It's like, at first, your mind goes, what? No way! It's like, ugh, offensive information. As he explains it and you listen, all of a sudden, if you were couldn't relax and allow your mind to at least track with him, you can then start seeing it from his perspective and go, wow, this is very rational. This, this makes a lot of sense. This, this might be the case. Might be the case. Not is the case, might be the case. And what would it look like if it was the case? What if what he's saying is true, that for thousands, literally so many hundreds of years that people have drawn images of the Mishkan, it's like, yeah, but why would so many people all draw it rectangular? How can they all be wrong? But then he went and looked, and everybody that drew a picture of the Mishkan drew it a little differently. So even thinking it was a rectangular base instead of a round base, they still can't agree. So the idea is that you think there's a certain amount of an agreement and there's really not. Anyway, it boils down to saying, what do these words really say? So Sally has been looking at the words a certain way, similar to what I do and Tiffany's been doing and maybe some other, but I know at least us three have that common and Rebecca Hashrider also. So what I'm saying is that certain people's minds work a certain way, which is going to be different than other people's minds work in another way, and it doesn't mean this one's right and this one's wrong. It just means if you look at things a certain way, you can see things. And so what I'm trying to do is show you what I see. She was seeing something other than what I had seen. It's like, wow, that, it's a refreshing insight. I don't presume to know it all. I'm just trying to show you what I see. Hopefully then like with, with Sally's case, you'll see something that maybe we don't see. This is the opening of his words, the expounding of what's locked up inside the pictographs of the Paleo-Hebrew that no one has even looked at, I dare to say, since the days of Daniel, 500 BC. I mean, this stuff, it's like there was a, I do construction work, there was this one day we were doing some demolition and tore up a concrete floor of a house and suddenly all this dust went up in the air, and it's like, that dust has not seen the fresh air, the light of day, for a hundred years. And suddenly the dust is, the earth is breathing. It's like, what a concept. The stuff that's in these words, we're, we're opening them up to resonate with everything else that Yahweh made. And no, no human mind, well, maybe some, but... I'll, I'll, I'll kind of say, no human minds have been able to contemplate, have been allowed to ponder, to see, to meditate, to, to intake and respond for 2,500 years. And you can say, well, so what? So what? What a, what a, what a great question. What is the significance? Just for what it's worth. So what was the name of the lecture, the, the talk I gave back in 2006 at my friend's house in Bend, Oregon, and it's on the uh, website. Here, just for the record, if anybody's interested, the uh, website, if you go to erectology.net, 
there's uh, videos from the last uh, 10 years or so on there, and these videos will go there. Plus, you're going to put these videos on your site too. Once you've got them together, yeah, um, we can link them into the Sukkot group. Okay, so please feel free to send them around, and if you even, as far as I'm concerned, if anybody wants to just extract a couple minutes or a few seconds and repost it with your own commentary, even if you don't like it, go ahead. I don't care. It's just to get it out there, right? So it's wide open. Anyway, a whole bunch of videos are at that website. And as of just a couple months ago, the entire Bible, not just the Old Testament, the Tanakh, but including the New Testament, in this Paleo-Hebrew font of the, uh, well, oh, sorry, the Eritology font, the entire Bible, no English translation, but just the words of the entire Bible are on the internet at Eritology.net. Go to study resources for free. Two versions, one written black ink on white lines like this, and the other one has about, about an inch and a half spacing between the lines in red ink. The name Yahweh is in blue. The Aleph Tavs are in purple, and the jots and tittles are in gold. So it's blue, purple, red, white, and gold. I think it's beautiful, and it's the entire scripture written in Paleo-Hebrew. Never, never been presented ever before in the history of the planet. I think it's a spectacular occasion. And you're free to download any page or print them off as much as you want. People have asked uh, whether we're going to put them in a bound format, and I've got to talk to the publisher of the Red Dictionary in Jerusalem about that, see if he's interested. But anyway, just so you know, it, it's wide open, it's for people to have if you're interested in this, to do your own study. So, here's the point. If you look at Exodus 3, this is what, verse 1, this is what it says. Moses was shepherding the sheep of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He guided the sheep far into the wilderness, and he arrived at the mountain of God toward Horeb. It's just a simple little narrative. It's just a simple story. I mean, how can you mess that up? I'm not saying it's messed up. I'm saying there's something hidden in there that I don't know that anybody's ever seen. Next verse. An angel, an angel of Yahweh appeared to him. Now, what do you picture in your mind? Picture you're a movie director and you're staging this scene. Okay, here you got this guy that looks like Michael Rood, you know, with the turban and the staff, and he's walking around out in the wilderness toward this mountain of God, whatever that means, a place called Horeb, and all of a sudden an angel. So picture him with wings and a gold crown and white flowing robe, and he starts to speak to Moshe. In a blaze of fire... Oh, from amidst the bush. Okay, so it's not just standing there, but now it says an angel appeared in the fire in the bush. Was there an, a person form in the flames that he saw? A humanoid form, maybe? In the, amid the bush. And he saw, that would be Moshe, and behold, the bush was burning in the fire, but the bush was not consumed. And so Moshe thinks, remember that word, being, think, bet yod nun? Moses is now thinking, I will turn aside now and look at this great sight. Why will the bush not be burned? Now the interesting thing is if you look at that word, why, it's spelled mem, dalet, vav, ayin. Mem, dalet, vav, ayin. So this would be that letter M. D, and again, that's an O, U, a V, or W phonetic pronunciation. And then an ion is pronounced as either an A, O, E, or a U, or kind of a guttural G, H. Back of your throat, a slight guttural. Not like the heavy guttural compared to the chet. So, medoch, medoch. Regardless of the, of the uh, phonetic sound of it, if you look in the dictionary, it means... Scientification. Science. The word Dalit Bav Ayan, or specifically Dalit Ayan, or Dalit Ayan Tav, is the word for knowledge. So, 
when you stick yod or vavs in between the letters, again, they're, they're kind of like these wild cards, right? You're playing cards and you get this thing that can be anything and you stick it in and it changes it a little bit, but you can make it be what you want. It, 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 it empowers it and leans it this way or that way. To know what the yods and vavs do, you do like I could stick a, a yod or a vav in, in between here or in between here, and then you can stick prefix letters and suffix letters. Mem happens to be a prefix letter. So here, just as an example, and, and, I, and I say this because I'm trying to help you understand how to read Hebrew, as well as talking about this big concept, that if you see an example of how something works in, a, in an easy to understand form, then you can take that as a principle and apply it elsewhere. So for example, the word gone is garden, Gimel new. What is a garden? Garden in English. Do you know why it's called a garden? Anybody? Why do the why in English is that piece of land with the fence around it and a special watering attachment nearby? Why is it called a garden? Why, if you take your your little children and send them to a school with a certain amount of supervision to teach them, is it called kinder? Garden. English words, take a guess. You're guarding. Guard, guard, guard. It's all the same thing. So the garden is that special group of plants that you give particular special attention to to make sure high fence, the deers don't get in, nobody's going to step on them. You wrap your mind around that. Okay, so kinder, guard, kinder, the kinfolk, the, the children are the kinder. I think that's German root place where you guard the children, kindergarten. Okay, so, how do you guard the garden? What does that mean? Well, not only special attention, but you shield it. You shield the children. You shield it. In Montana, those deers will jump over even an eight-foot high fence. <laughs> anyway, the point is, you put a shield. Well, if you put the letter mem in front of the garden, now this is the word mogan where you also get the girl's name, Megan. Because that mem is a prefix letter, puts it into a noun form. Or it means the place where, or the place of. Or maybe even, there's some words, I, I don't know that much about the grammar. And I don't have that big a vocabulary. I know a bunch of words, but, but the point is, if you have a guy who does carpentry, the guy who is the carpenter, if you stick the mem in front of that word carpentry, it basically is talking about it, that guy who does that thing. So that's, that's the way a mem works. So when you have a word like this, so what I'm saying is that use this as an example for how this works. So here's a mem. So you're taking the word, the verb root of knowledge, dalet ayin, you're putting a vav in between, so that's going to change it somehow, and you can look in the dictionary to see how it changes. But then when you put a mem in front of it, it's, this is now the place where knowledge functions, or the one who is using knowledge as a tool to do something. And because it means, in the dictionary translation, scientification, Moshe just didn't go, hey, wow, look at that, that's interesting. I mean, he did that, but then when it says he turned... He was already facing the bush. How could he turn? Somehow, Moshe was conducting his life, shepherding the, the flock. I'm not going to disparage shepherds, but come on, how hard is it to shepherd a flock, right? How hard is it to you know, keep a kind of containment on four kids, much less 40 kids in the kindergarten? But what I'm saying is that his distraction is already, where's those, where's those sheep? What's going on? And making sure there's no wild animals. And he's very attentive all over the place. He sees this burning bush. He's already turned. He's already looking. But to say he turned, we're going to analyze that word later. There's something about that word. But for him to lock on to the messenger, Malak is messenger, angel. But it's also a message being sent. He somehow perceived that a messenger was being sent through the bush, in the midst of the bush. Some, something about that bush was communicating. But we picture an angel with wings and a flowing white robe. Not necessarily. There's a different way to see this picture. 
So when he turned, he locked his mind onto that subject. He's going, how is this possible? So suddenly he's not even thinking about the goats, and he's and he's I gotta see this, and he's and he's trying to wrap his mind on. What am I seeing? What am I noticing? What's happening here? How do I analyze it? Dalit is a door. Bob is a nail. Ian is an eyeball. Simple pictographic meanings. So now he's in the place of entering into a fixed lockdown comprehension. The letter Ian, the word Ian means to weigh. You put something in scales, weigh carefully. Not just, hey, what is it? But carefully weigh, balance exactly, to measure and try to. This has to be perfect, which is what scientists do. And yet scientists keep coming up with all kinds of different ideas and answers because of their perspective. What are they, what are they seeing? So the perspective where you come from is going to affect your analysis of what you think you're beholding. Excuse me? Perspective. It, yes, it affects your perspective. In that, somebody told me years ago, I was raised Christian. Christian church, Christian school, ever since I was a little kid, hearing the Bible stories from a New Testament Christian perspective, 20th century America. It's simply the truth. Well, that's not a bias. Eh, wrong. Everything is a bias that you've learned. I'm wearing, as it were, Christian spectacles, and I'm reading the Bible, and I'm, and I'm reading stuff. And then I start looking at the Tanakh, the, the Torah, the Old Testament, and I see this Mishkan pattern, and I see, as I said yesterday, Yeshua, Hamashiach, is the guy described by all these 22 Hebrew letters. And my friend says, how do you know you're not just seeing it because of your bias, your Christian perspective? You see, because you have these Christian spectacles, which some, pe some Jewish guy say who learned Hebrew, who only read the Old Testament Tanakh, never having even heard about Yeshua. They've heard phantom stories of this Jesus Christ character who was responsible sending his church to conduct the Holocaust and the Inquisition and stuff like that. And, and maybe that's all they've ever heard. The guy's a, a barbaric scoundrel. He's certainly no prophet or holy man. If that's all they see, they're going to watch, look at it in their spectacles. <laughs> they're not going to see the Messiah. It's like, how do I take the spectacles off and see with clean eyes? Sorry, can't do it. I'm subject to the way I was taught, the way my brain functions. But so when I showed you yesterday, I wrote over here, uh, the, the angel Gabriel said that Daniel hides the word of some book until I endow it, the time I am tov, and that word's hyphenated in Daniel 12, 4, that this is, this letter, weigh, measure, balance, perceive, comprehend, understand, the door, Dalit, and weigh, measure, con perceive, understand, tov, which is a, a mark or a sign similar to a musical note, but each letter, whether it's English or whether it's numbers, a, a number, one, two, three, every, every number is just a, a squiggle that means something. Understand the meaning of the mark, the scribble. Understand that Yeshua is yoked. The word for yoke or connected is actually spelled ayin lamed, which is typically translated as meaning above. So you get this verse in, I believe it's the Psalms, it says, He has exalted His Word above all His name. So here's like a little riddle. What does that mean? Can somebody, can somebody translate this phrase? It's in English, but how do you translate this? He has exalted His Word above all His name. Anybody want to venture a guess what that means? No? There was a fellow, an SDA guy I was working with, and he says, oh, what that means is, the name doesn't matter. This name of Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, doesn't matter. Because his word is what matters. Now, this guy was an SDA, and he was trying to tell me about the Sabbath today, and it's like, whatever. But I was just learning about the name Yahweh. He said, hey, what does that name mean? It seems to be kind of important. He says, no, I may think that... The day doesn't matter, like whatever, because I was raised regarding Sunday as the holy day. He says, no, no, Saturday is the holy day, the seventh day. It's like, so, 
It was nailed to the cross. But, but his name, now that's important. His no, his name. He's exalted his word above his name. And back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then a couple years later, once I started learning Hebrew, I thought, oh, I'll take a look at that. What does it actually say in Hebrew? Well, this word above is this little word here, ayin lamed. It can mean above, but it also means next to, at, by, according, in reference. And it's actually a yoke. Well, if you have a yoke, Yeshua said, don't be unequally yoked. So here you have like scales of balance. That's, that's my little symbol that I use for balance scales, right? A little, little dish here, and you put a certain amount of weight here, and the, the, the weight has to balance. Or if you put some carrots in here that you're trying to sell, and you have to have 20 shekels over here, then you the, the shekels of silver, metaphorically, not that they put them in a the scale, have to balance and equal the carrots so that you own the carrots. They have to be equal. So when they're balanced, this is the word tet, which means stalemate, like if you're playing chess, and nobody can move, and so nobody wins or loses. Not chess, stale chess, what? Stalemate. <laughs> Track of thought. <laughs> anyway, a stalemate is balanced scales. And so the word for judge is shofet, which is where you put the sheen, tet. So judges, the book of judges, is shofetim, so you have this suffix ending, and then when you have the, the mem of shofet, mem, sheen, hey, tet, that's the word pronounced mishpat, because this is a, an, a letter M, and this is the sheen, which is that shape. The P is, is the pay is the P and the F, which is where you get P, H, it's both. And then this is the T, so there you get mishpat, or mishpat. Mishpat there's a parasha reading called Mishvatim. That's plural. It's translated right rulings, judgments, or this is how people live together with balanced scales. If your animal gets out and tears something up, then you have to recompense, you have to repay, you have to balance the scales. If your kid throws a rock and hits your neighbor's car, now you got to deal with it. Don't just say, ah, shut up. And it's like, that's not Mishvat. You've got to pay back even the scale. That's where you get the concept, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Mishpat, balanced scales. Well, those balanced scales are, this is the yoke. It's like if you have a teeter-totter and this is heavier than that, how do you balance the scales so you have a balanced teeter-totter? It's the same picture. So that balanced scales where these things are tied together is the yoke. So if he says, he has exalted his word, here, this is the word, on one side, above all his name, it's not above all, it's, in, it's yoked to his name. So my understanding of that, if somebody says, his word says, keep Yom HaShabbat, the seventh day Sabbath, and you go, if you see somebody keeping the seventh day Sabbath, you could say, I'll bet that you regard Yahweh. Or if you see somebody with name Yahweh on their hat or their shirt, you can say, I'll bet you keep the seventh day Sabbath, don't you? In fact, I was working on a job, and I said something, uh, somebody's going to bring home some uh, lunch for us to eat, and I said, uh, no, no, no pork, please. And the tile guy says, I bet you don't work on Saturdays either. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the name and the word are tied together, yoked together. One is the direct reference of the other. Yeshua said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I hear the Father saying. I'm not making this stuff up. These are not my words. That's what Yeshua said. What did he mean? He is so perfectly balanced, yoked to his Father, there's no discrepancy. Mishpat. Yahweh said, Mishpat and Zadikah are the foundation of his throne. So picture this. You have this balance, right? Perfectly balanced. So here's a, here's a platform, and let's say underneath here, it sets on a, on a sphere. And so it's a side view like this, or, or even, a, even a point. But the thing is, if you start weighting this corner, you better have the same weight on this, well, then it'll tip, so you have to have the same weight on this corner and the same weight on that. It's got to be perfectly balanced all the way along, or some of these things going to fall. Well, picture... Extend this, and this is Yahweh's chair, his throne, metaphorically, right? 
And it's like, man, if it's not balanced, he's going to go for a fall. And he says, Mishpat is the foundation, Mishpat and Zadokah, the foundation of his throne. This concept of balanced scales is so important to him that if we conduct our lives out of balance in any way, especially Mishpatim and dealing with one another, he's not there. His throne, his reign, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Ten Commandments. If we're conducting anything in our life against our neighbor, that's the word for evil, ra, resh ayin, resh ayin, or resh ayin sheen, is the word for evil, but it's also harm or some inflicted oppression, hurting or taking advantage, taking advantage of trying to tip the scales, cheating. There's another place he says, unbalanced scales, he hates that. What I'm saying is, you read these things and you put them all together, trying to picture that suffering, suffering, connecting the dots, forming a picture like the constellations. This is his game. I mentioned yesterday is that the sport of the heavens is messing with words and putting them together and finding out what's it all about. Because his throne rests on Mishpat, then the way to have thy kingdom come and thy will be done is for us to scour our life and the life of our neighborhood and nation and bring about Mishpat. So Jesse can tell you about how you have this tribal they were given certain lands and so they have the authority and so if you want to bring healing you have to recognize the authority as protocol. Back in 1997 there was a million man Christian march on Washington DC and I wasn't there but I, I, I've heard that they had Native Americans and uh, black people that had been held as slaves and from all these different races and even the white guys and they were admitting offenses against one another over the last couple hundred years and apologizing and asking for forgiveness, repenting, teshuva, to bring healing. You say, yeah, yeah, blah, whatever, blah, 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 just yapping up there in front of the camera. No! They're conducting mishpat in order to get Yahweh to enter in. Because if mishpat isn't happening, he's not going to be there. That's a principle. As a basic foundational principle, from that, we can step into other principles of the kingdom which are all about his rulership and authority on the throne. But if the throne doesn't have a basis, it can't happen. I'm, I'm emphasizing that because this is a critical consideration. What is the definition of evil? You could say, here's a head and here's an eyeball. So you could say, hmm, if you have in your head to tip the scales of balance where you get the advantage, so it's not a stalemate, it's not, that's evil, even to a little bit, hear this, if you have in your head, if you have in your head to steal the advantage over somebody else inappropriately, that's evil, by definition, that, in, 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 a, in a little level, you can think, hey, just trying to, just trying to rip it off, and, you know, the finger on the seal, for example, a friend of mine years ago said, his dad was pretty clever, pretty clever, when he'd go to the dump, he had his dog with him, pretty good sized dog, and he'd have the dog get out of the car on the scale, because you stand there, you know, you get out of your car and you stand there, they weigh your truck. Okay, goes and he dumps stuff, and then when they weigh, he leaves the dog sitting in the car. <laughs> That's a hundred pounds that he didn't have to pay for. Pretty clever. You know what he just did? He established the scales for the rest of his life, saying, I think it's okay for me to rip you off by 100 pounds. It's like, you always saying, okay, remember what he said? The measure you use will be measured to you. So he just authorized everybody else that he ever conducts business with, the carpenter, the electrician, the butcher, the, the tailor, the grocery store, everybody's allowed to rip me off for 100 pounds every single act of commerce he does for the rest of his life because he established the weight and measure to be used against him and even in the world to come possibly all of a sudden he's not so clever all of a sudden it matters because you see it differently it's like gosh that guy was a darn fool imagine some simple little thing of thinking that you're kind of smart so you're going to kind of cheat the other guy for just just 
just a dollar or two. <laughs> it's going to cost you millions of dollars by the time you're done. Because everything is like a seed, and Yeshua even said. The seeds produce fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. And imagine that everything you do, ripping off the other guy, oh, wait a minute, let's have a different imagination. Let's imagine that everything you do for good, ho, het, vav, bet. Well, catch actually a full basket. And you could say bet is as actually a house. So now you have full provisions of the house. That's the word tov, T-O-V, which is simply the word translated good. So when he said that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was tov vera. So if you decided to put good in your tide of the scales, just even a little bit, what that, what that means is that in order to balance the scales, Yahweh himself, by his authority, has to decree and see to it that goodness flows into you from all around to balance the scales. And then there's a verse that says, I can't remember where it is, I'd have to look it up, but just saying, it says, Mishpat like water, Zadika like a raging river. Mishpat like water. He's saying that something else that they were doing, he says, rather, Mishpat like water. Well, Mishpat like water, what does that mean? Well, water seeks its own level. If you have a, a, a lake, or a pool, or say a, a, a plastic tarp with some water in it, and you lift up one side, what, you know, what's the water going to do? It's going to try to stay there, so the water sloshes. Water always tries to find its own level, which is the stalemate, which is even. That's just what water does. So if we try to conduct our life with even balanced scales of mishpat, righteousness like a mighty river, the word zadika, remember I said it was mishpat and zadika is the foundation of his throne. Uh, there, there may or may not be a yod because that's the, uh, the wild card. So sometimes it's just zadi delik kuf, zadi. But anyway, like a mighty river, righteousness, so when mishpat is balanced scales, that is righteousness. But what does he mean by like a mighty river? Balanced scales of mishpat, the water's not flowing anywhere. We're just trying to make things even. Unevil. Even, because evil is out of balance. Trying to trying to get something over on the other guy. How would you spell Zadika as phonetic like you would spell? Here, I, I write it as T Z, that's Zadi, D Q. And if it's Zadik, you put an I in between. Zadik. Zadik. Zadika, you, like you, have a, Zadika, you just have a hey at the end. So what I was going to say, the word Zadik is righteous. The word Zadika is righteousness. So there's another example, like with the, with the Mogan putting an M as a prefix. If you write a hey as a suffix, think of the difference. The word righteous is a description. Zadika, so you put a hey at the end, it's righteousness. That's what it looks like. So righteous, that's a description, like a title, like a, just saying what the thing is. But righteousness is that thing in action. So when you put a hey at the end of the word, it kind of means it's in action. Okay, so here's the point, though. If, 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 if finding the balance of scales, because Yahweh said so, is actually doing mishpat, but because you're doing what Yahweh said, it actually is zadik or zadika. That is righteousness. What does it mean like a flowing river? Well, the word zadika also means victory, deliverance, and salvation. So what he's saying is that you have to balance the scales in your life if you want him to allow victory, deliverance, and salvation. And it'll come in like a mighty river. If you have a tarp and it's sitting calm, balanced, and you lift it up, that water's going to rush to try to find balance again. And the, if we do Zadika, or Mishpat, which is Zadika, the only way for him to balance the scales is to bring victory, deliverance, and salvation, which is Yeshua, but it's also the concept of success, which is Tov, full basket of the house, rushing in like a river, immediately, <laughs> overwhelming. And that's just the way he conducts his dominion. What's so the this is true. For for Reshine, what would you say? Reshine, well, you could say that the, the Reshine, 
Reshaim is translated evil, harm, malady, oppression, messing with someone, wickedness, evil. But it also means friend and companion and associate, colleague. And it also means thought and intention. That's on your chart? No, that was not on the chart. That's another way to look at it. But what I'm saying is that's in the dictionary. But just putting that all together, separating it, connecting the dots. Evil is when you have the intention, which is the purpose on purpose, to bring harm to your neighbor. Here, is this book evil? No, but if I use the, this book to trip, he says, do not put a stumbling block in front of the blind. If I put this in front of the blind so they dip over and I pull money out of their pocket, <laughs> pretty smart. No, I could say, well, physically, that's not pretty smart, that's pretty cruel, but people do that all the time. The blind come to church in order to hear the truth, to be healed, to be made full, to, to get their empty house basket have a little more, few more crumbs in it, and they're told lies because somebody is using the word to trip them up to extract coins from their pocket. That's, metaphorically, putting a stumbling block in front of the blind. And Yahweh hates that. Again, why I'm emphasizing such things as hates and with these passionate verbs is because this is all about getting to know our Father. He gave us his words, and like I said, he hid himself in the words. And once you start looking at these words in Hebrew and analyzing some of these texts that are in Isaiah or Hosea or Zechariah, and you start bumping into these different words, it's like, I've never heard this stuff in all my life. Never heard these principles ever discussed, ever brought to the forefront. These words have never been opened to me. The only way I found these words is by looking at the words. I didn't study this from somebody. It's just in looking at the words. Can't you say? What have you found? Just to calling you out of the blue here, Sally. What have you found? Can you put in your own words the type of thing? You want, here, you want to be on, on camera and speak to the. No? <laughs> um, as far as any specific word or. Any specific word. What have you found? What is your personal experience? What is it like to look into the words from your perspective? It brings it to life, it enhances to a more than just a shape or a sound, but there is actual meaning, and there's there's width, there's height, there's depth, there's there's so much in just one of the letters. So if there's one, if there's if that's if one letter, then that's in all letters, and it's it's so profound, so rich that the English language doesn't even. Explain it well because we're, it really it shows us how far we we are from it. But that we have an invitation and an opportunity to be brought back to this after all this time, it's it, it, it's confirmation. It, it's 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 like clicks going off, popcorn popping up. It and it and, and it's it's living. Um, and it's wonderful and pure in such a, a beautiful truth. And when I first got to a place where I read it and really, really read it, I had to repent. I had to because it's, it's so beautiful, so beautiful that of what what's happened with it. He says, until you. You make my 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 shem kadosh, and I read I, I I. But in order to get to that place where we see that and recognize the shem is kadosh, it's, it's kadosh. We have to learn it, and um, learning it in the modern Hebrew is important because that's what we have available to in the scripture. But the paleo is like the uh, definition of the letters. And uh, like Eric talks about the I and Dalit, I and Tav, in Daniel 12, it's like you, in order to be able to, you have to have, in order to have one, you have to have the other. So we're not walking around with one shoe. We got both shoes on. So we can fully operate in what we have. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And 
I can in, in the ending of the letters, if you take the word Mishkan and look at it in the meanings of the paleo, that that's really big too. Um, I was just thinking about that when you were talking, especially when it came to what we were watching um, yesterday in regards to the, the, the construction of the Mishkan. Um, but you could take any letter, any any word, just start it for bare sheet and, and and look at the meanings of the letters as it pertains to that word and it'll just really show you something very, very, very beautiful and very special. And uh, and it's not like we're we're trying to point fingers or any of that. It's 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 a turning and it's a it's a healing and it's a forgiving and turning. It's a um, it's a hot. A hot. A hot. Unity, unifying, yes. bringing back to the oneness. A hot. And I love the word a hot. If you think about it, it starts with the breath. A hot. It's in the Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Hod. A hot means in translation in English means one. And that's a He's a creation, but the heart has so much meaning in one. And it starts with the breath, and then it moves in, and it moves up, and it comes through that. Uh, okay. And then it releases out. It's a special word. I heard you say that one too. It's essentially a picture of the balance scale, the oneness. Chapter 6, verse 4. It's the Shema. The Shema. It's the Hero of Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Thank you. <laughs> so, the point of all this is that that word, as she's pointing out, Akkad, that oneness, that unity, is an aspect of the stalemate, perfect balance. Yeshua is not above his Father, his Father not above Yeshua. The Ayan Dalit is not above the Ayan Tav. The balance scales, it, it becomes this perspective of the entire kingdom. So, think about this phrase. Shema Israel. Listen, listen pay attention, now get this. That's Shema. Israel. Hey, who's that person over there? Oh, that's not Israel. Okay, he doesn't have to pay attention. You want to be Israel? Okay, you should pay attention to this. Okay, so he's, he's singling out like separating the sheep from the goats concept. Who, who wants to be his people, Israel, according to the terms of this covenant? The Christian understanding of eternal life because of the shed blood of Yeshua, that's not in contention. This has nothing to do with that. This has to do with the covenant where Yahweh says, on the walking the face of the earth, I will be your Elohim, and you'll be my people, and we have this contract deal with balanced scales. I'll do this, and you do that. I'll be your Elohim, your champion and defender and your provider, and you will be my people who listen, who teach, who do what I say, and you'll conduct your life in righteousness and mishpat. That's the contract. That's the covenant. And so for the Christian the aspect to say, oh, and by the way, if you recognize who Yeshua is, who is Akkad with all this, and you bring them one with your Akkad with your heart, guess what? It's unto eternity. Proven by the fact he rose up from the grave, which is the letter Zadi, ascended the letter Kuf, coming back the letter Kuf as Rashi Tav reading the story. That's just saying, hey, there's a there's a cherry on top of the ice cream. But he's already given us the ice cream on the cake, which is this covenant. Yeah. That that's just for the record. That's where I see the distinction between the, the New Testament and Old Testament. But the, but the point is, for Moshe to turn and understand. If because I'm, I'm, all this was getting me back to just get this one word. Iron is balancing, weighing carefully, exactly, because it's the door, you might say. The door to what? Yeshua said, if you recognize me, I'm the only door to the Father. So there's something about this. Men is a place, men is a room, men is a place is closed up. We have some rain, so I'm gonna have to shout a little louder here. Let me calm it down. Anyway, Moshe turned to think, to calculate, to understand the sight, and then a message came through the sight. 
So I'm going to elaborate later, next session, session four, about those words. But let me go on reading, just, just so it's on record what we're talking about. Yahweh said to Moshe in Midian, no wait, wrong, wrong chapter. The page had turned. <laughs> Yahweh saw that he had turned. Now imagine that. Yahweh's got a plan. Yahweh wants to do something. And he's sitting there and saying, how do I catch Moshe's attention? Moshe is responsible. Moshe is out there shepherding his father's sheep. And, and Yahweh could go, Yahweh could just hit him with a lightning bolt. Wham! And Moshe would go, what? That's not what happened. Yahweh had this little thing happen. The bush was on fire. And he's waiting. He's just waiting. He's just waiting. The word to wait, kufav, is also the word for hope. It means fishing. So Yahweh was fishing for Moshe. And soon as he noticed that Moshe noticed, and so Moshe turned and went to scientifically regard what's happening, then Yahweh says, ah, now I've got him. So Yahweh noticed that Moshe noticed. And Yahweh called out to him from amid the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe. And Moshe said, here am I. That's where he named me. Again, we're reading narrative. There's another way to read this, which we'll get into later. And he said, Yahweh said, don't come any closer, Moshe, stop. Remove your shoes from your feet, for the place upon which you stand is holy ground. Holy ground? Did you ever know that there really was such a thing? That almost sounds like something spiritist or occultist might say, oh, holy ground. Or, hey, there's a church we put across. It's holy ground. Is that even a real concept? Well, this seems to say it is, but whoa, no, that's the translation and our mind wrapping around it. Is there such a thing as holy ground? I'm not saying there's not, but I'm saying you have to think about that. What does that mean, holy ground? How do we know that that's the best translation? There may be another way to read this. As the alternative to this, were you saying, Jesse, that over in Hawaii, that people pick up little stones and they take them back with them as a souvenir at home? You want, you want to say what uh, happened that you saw when you were over there? You want to be on camera? Because I don't know if anybody can hear with the, with the noise here. It's a very interesting story. This is the antithesis of holy ground, just so you know. That's why I'm asking them to say it. So, uh, I used to work in the Hawaii for a, a medical equipment company selling microscopes. And there's a uh, solar, I mean, a uh, stellar observatory up on Mount Haleakala. And they wanted to calibrate their telescope. So they asked me to bring some microscopes so we could calibrate the base. And as we were signing up to go into the, it's a national park as well, we were signing up at the desk, and I looked in the back, in the back room, the room and every bit as big as this canopy here, and there were just hundreds and hundreds of shoe boxes. I thought that was pretty odd for a national park to have shoe boxes by the hundreds stacked up in the back, and I said, oh, you're moving. And the lady at the desk said, no, we're not moving. Come back here and I'll show you. I didn't know what was up. She said, pick any box. I said, okay, that one. She said, read this letter. She said, read this letter. And read this letter. What was happening was, these artifacts, these souvenirs, when they got them back in the United States Continental, curses were falling on people left and right by the hundreds and even the thousands. And those, they were returning the objects that they took from the islands. Wow. Deaths in the family, car crashes, sickness, illness, property loss, it was just on and on. I read about three letters, that was enough to convince me. That, so, Anyway, Pele is the female goddess of the volcano, the eruption, uh, and uh, of course there's even more mountains being born underneath the ocean 
next to the big island right now. And uh, so it's like a spiritual battleground uh, amidst. And then King Kamehameha, he was prophesied 500 years before he came on the scene to be the killer of all the chiefs, the chief killer prophecy. And then also that the Hawaiian people would be witnessed to like never before from some strangers who were carrying a black box. And so when Captain Kuki sails into Lahaina Bay, and uh, the steward of the uh, ship, the pastor, the uh, chaplain of the ship, comes out with a black box with a Bible in it. Was that moment? And then King Kamehameha did kill all these chiefs and threw them off of the Pali lookout. And uh, that's that's when I hiked up there in the Kuulau Mountain Range. I had knee surgery. Uh, I was rehabbing and. Uh, that was the darkest feeling I've ever felt in my life. Cause you could just sense the, the death that had taken place there. And uh, the blood does cry out from the land. You know, this is a whole indigenous thing going on. So in the island of Fiji, uh, there's similar tales. But uh, it's not isolated there. Obviously, we know what happened in the Philippines. And even here. And Vietnam. So yes. There's, there's much going on in the spiritual battles, uh, even today, resonating throughout the uh, centuries, really. And they have cities of refuge. That's correct. Uh, and then you've got Cahokia. Anyone here know about Cahokia? It's the largest pyramid in the world, built on the banks of the Mississippi River, right in Illinois. Uh, still there, the foundation of the whole pyramid. Still, It's an earthen uh, pyramid but uh, it was the city of the sun. So, anyway, the civilizations that we uh, are standing on, you know, eventually that comes up and brings us enlightenment and uh, discernment that we should be paying attention to Abba's word. Is there, is there a, a pyramid here somewhere that they've discovered uh, in this region? Well, there's effigy mounds here, and then there's a lot of... Uh, both uh, household utility mounds, but also spiritual mounds and burial mounds. Well, they're I guess, different than that. This was a pyramid. An actual pyramid. Yes, but I'm not sure. It's near, it's it's in this region. Yeah. Uh, I haven't heard about that one. So it's kinda, new, kind of, in the last few years. I'll do more research on it and let you know on Facebook. Okay. All right, any more, you, no, any okay. more commentary? Thank you. We'll, we'll carry on. We've been okay. running out of time here. Let me just say this. Pele, the Hawaiian goddess. Yahweh said, don't even mention the names of these other deities. However, if you look in the dictionary, the Hebrew dictionary, there's three different ways to spell Pele. It's Pe Lamed Yod, Pe Lamed Aleph, and Pe Lamed Hey. Pele. And they all mean the same thing. Wonderful, marvelous, hidden mystery. Amazing, astounding. If you put a vav, so it's peleo, that just means it or he. And if you put a tav, peleot, that's plural, wonders. There's a verse that said that Yahweh has performed amazing wonders. Peleot are the amazing wonders. Ose fele. Ose is the word spelled ayin shin he. And that's where the, the vav, uh, or the ayin, in that case, is pronounced as an o. And the shin, in that case, is an s. So it's, and this is the uh, asm. Ose, which means to do, make, produce, act, cause, Paleo. And then as we said yesterday when David said, please open my eyes that I may see the wonders or behold what you really hid in your Torah to put the noon in front of it so it's nephilot, that's that he caused to be hidden. So that's where the letter noon is like this lightning bolt. So, slight distraction carrying off of what Jesse was saying. If you take the word ha, wa, e, in English, there's this syllable, ha, oo, that's not a syllable, but it's kind of the oo sound. This is another ah sound, 
And this is the E sound. Ha u a e. The yod is the E sound, phonetic. A could be an aleph, not that silent. Could be an ayan, yeah, but it also is kind of these others, more like a guttural. It technically could be a hey. The U is the vav, which is the, the double O or the U. And then here's a ha, which is the letter hey. Ha u a e could be read Hebraically right to left. Yod he vav he. E a u a, which is very similar to I o w a. E a u a. So it's all the same word. I think. Iowa, Hawaii is the name, the tetragrammaton of the creator of the universe. So picture being on a ship out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean many, many, many years ago, and all of a sudden you come across this beautiful island, and then you see this fantastic volcano going off that you can get right up to. In fact, you can get right up to the edge, and you say, Oh, say, Fele. Hasn't he done wonderful, marvelous things? And then years later, somebody turns the wonderful, marvelous, hidden things of Yahuwah that he's done and turns it into a pagan deity. And then they take Asha, Ayan Shin He, which is a, oh, excuse me, Al Shin He, which is a fire offering, but it's also a woman. Ash is fire, but Asha is a firewoman, but Asha is a woman as Ish is a man. Frank Seekins does a little thing. If you take the yod out of man and the hay out of woman, you have two fires, ash and ash. So in his, in his marital counseling, he says, you know, you've got to keep you on the relationship. But Asha is, in Hebrew, a fire offering, and it's also a woman. So because people fail to regard the Torah in Hawaii, that they take the beautiful, wonderful thing that Yahweh made that he hid out there in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and they take their young daughters and throw them as fire offerings into the volcano, thinking they're appeasing some goddess, which doesn't even really exist, because Yahweh said, I am the only Elohim. Here's my, here's my point. To look at Deuteronomy 29, 25 for a moment. This is the source of all trouble in the history of the planet. Deuteronomy 29, and then I will, just so you know where we're headed because we're almost out of time for this session, is I'm going to show you how that interfaces with the burning bush. Deuteronomy 29, 21, start there. Well, let's back up. That's bad. Oh, gosh, here. Let me back up to just say verse 15. And then you can read the whole chapter, but here. Well, oh, gosh, okay, I want to back up. <laughs> verse 9. You are standing, this is Moshe on his, just facing his deathbed. Moses was just about to die. He's gathered the people of Israel together, and he's speaking to them, giving them his, like, last famous words. You are standing here today, all of you, before Yahweh your Elohim, the heads of your tribes, your elders, your officers, all the men of Israel, your small children, your women, your, the proselyte, the stranger who is in the midst of your camp, from the hewer of your wood to the drawer of your water, that's your slaves and servants, for you to pass into the covenant of Yahweh your Elohim. The word to pass into is also the word Hebrew. So everybody was gathered together saying, hey, hey we all volitionally want to become the Hebrew nation of Israel. And even if it's an old man, a nobleman, a peasant, a drawer, a server, a, a drawer of water and wood, and even the proselyte, hey, we choose life. We choose to become Israel. That's why they're gathered. As a covenant and into the imprecation, that's a curse, that Yahweh your Elohim seals with you today in order to establish you today as a people to him and that he be Elohim to you. Okay, so this contract deal has balanced scales, there's blessing and curse, we have to do something, he'll do something. He says, I will be your Elohim, El Shaddai, El Elyon, the Most High, all power is unto him, that he has the power to conquer all enemies, wipe away all opposition, and give all provisions to us. 
So El Shaddai is two things, the provider of all benefits and the one who wipes out all the opposition. That's what he said to do for us, including life, both here and forever, and what do we have to do? If we do what we're supposed to do, we get the blessing, which is what I just described he promised, and if we don't do, if we don't hear, if we don't Shema, then what we get is the curse, the imprecations, which he'll, that he told us is what it's going to look like once we catch the curse, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. So when we say Shema Israel, who? Israel is these people who decided to choose life and be part of this contract. That's who it's about. It's not about every, as they say in English, every Tom, Dick, and Harry. It's not about them. It's only us. We're not yelling at the church. We're not yelling at the synagogue. We're not yelling at the mosque or the temples out there, the, the, the pyramids scattered around. It has nothing to do with those guys. To be a people to him, and he be a God to you. That's the balance scales. And he spoke to you as, as he spoke to you. And I'm emphasizing English. We'd have to look it up in Hebrew to see exactly what it says. But in other words, this is according to the terms that he has already stated. So first to go back to what he already stated, which is Paleo-Hebrew. That's as far back as you can get. In order to establish you today as people in him, he allowed him to, as he spoke to you, and as he swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. I mention that because he mentions it again in Exodus 3. Yahweh identifies himself as the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yitzhak, and the Elohim of Yaakov. We are not to invoke the spirits of our dead ancestors, but Yahweh identifies himself as the Elohim that they acknowledged. We're not acknowledging them, we're acknowledging the Elohim that they acknowledge. Critical distinction in invoking his power. Not with you alone do I seal this covenant and this imprecation. Moshe speaking to those people back then. This was about 1500 BC. But with whoever is here standing with us today before Yahweh or Elohim, and with whoever is not here with us today, that's us. He was saying it's not just present tense, but it's projected in the future. We are standing here with them. Time lapse. Quantum physics, what we we're going to get into. For you know how we dwelt in Egypt. Now he's given them a little bit of history perspective. Dwelt in Egypt, and we passed through the midst of the nations whom you passed. And you saw their abominations and the detestable idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold that were with them. Now he's saying, listen, Yahweh has a little sightseeing tour, like going through a museum, through the history books of an encyclopedia. Yahweh said, hey, listen, let me show you something. Yahweh could have teleported them. He could have just picked them up out of Egypt and dropped them in the land of Israel. But he took them on this little tour through all their neighbors. And he says, see their culture? See what they did? See those pyramids? See those totem poles? See those special fires? See those incenses? See those fancy words and the, even their writings, perhaps? And see the way they did this? See, their, see the way they worshipped their gods? And you saw their abominations, their detestable idols. Verse 17. Perhaps there's among you a man or a woman or a family or a tribe whose heart turns away today from being with Yahweh, our Elohim, to go and serve. That word serve is obed, which is also the word that means worship. To serve, worship, or tend to the needs of the gods of those nations. Perhaps there is among you a root flourishing with gall and wormwood. What that means is somewhere deep inside you go, yeah, 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 I'm going to the program, I'm standing up, I'm raising my hands, I'm singing the songs, but inside it's like, yeah, come on, really, is this it? Look at those guys, they have some cool holidays. Look at those guys, they say some fancy words and they've got feathers, and these guys have, I like the smell of that incense, I really don't care for Yahweh's incense. Deep inside this root of gall and bitterness, wormwood, and it shall be that when he hears the words of this curse, he will bless himself. This is Yahweh speaking. He will bless himself in his heart, saying, Peace will be with me, though I walk as my heart sees fit. There I, by adding the water upon the thirsty. What he's saying is, if you listen to the words of this Torah, and you think, I'm okay. I've, I've got a clean heart. I can do what I want. Hey, I'm saved. It's cool. Yahweh loves everybody. Those guys preaching and Bible thumping, those, they're Torah terrorists. They got nothing on me. Oh, I believe in the one true God. 
I believe in the Savior of love and peace. There's no... I, I, I'm, not, I'm not guilty of any of this stuff. But yet inside, you turn away from these words of this Torah that he declared to Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Moshe, David, Yahu, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, Jeremiah, those guys. If we turn away from those words, even we think we've got a new covenant that gives us that allowance. Dangerous ground. Yahweh will not be willing to forgive him. What? For then Yahweh's anger and jealousy will smoke against that man, and the entire imprecation, the entire curse written in this book will come down upon him. And Yahweh will erase his name from under heaven. Yahweh will set him aside for evil. <laughs> Yahweh will set that man who does not have a regard for these words for evil among all the tribes of Israel like all the curses of the covenant written in this book of the Torah. And then we look at what happened on this land to the natives who lived here. We look at what happened to the Hawaiians when Kamehameha came. Why? We look at the land of Israel. It's a rotten, stinking, barren desert. Oh yeah, the Jews have irrigated some stuff and some stuff's growing, but not like the prophecy. It's going to look like a lush garden, like a jungle, tropical forest. He said he was going to restore it. It ain't there yet, so the word's not over yet. We've got some time in front of us. So the later generation will say, that's us. Remember, we stand here with them, and he says, the later generation, here we are. We are 3,500 years. Remember, the Sophie letters total, the value to 3,500. Maybe there's a message. Maybe this is talking about us here and now. The later generation will say, your children who arise after you, and the foreigner who will come from a distant land here, we're on the opposite side of the world here in the United States of America. That's about the distantest land as you can get, pretty much. When they will see it, the plagues of the land, that's over in Israel, and the illnesses with which the devil has afflicted, no, with which Yahweh has afflicted it, forget the devil, Yahweh brought these curses on his people. Sulfur, and this is what they will say. So I went over there, and when I say, gosh, Israel looks like a rotten, stinking desert, I'm quoting this verse. Sulfur and salt. Salt makes things so they don't grow. Sulfur stinks. Conflagration. That's just a burn to a crisp of the entire land. It cannot be sown. The Romans salted it so it can't, be, it can't produce crops. And it cannot sprout. No grass will rise upon it. Like the upheaval of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which Yahweh overturned in his anger and wrath. And all the nations will say, Why? What is his problem? That monster God of the Old Testament. Fortunately, we have gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He would never do such a thing. For what reason did Yahweh do so to this land? Why this wrathfulness of great anger? The word anger is nose. It's flaring. That's the picture of Yahweh. That he painted for his people to remember. If you want a picture of his face. And they will say, they, meaning us, we are that generation who has a perspective of what's really going on because they forsook the covenant of Yahweh, the Elohim of their forefathers, that he sealed. That word seal is kind of like this teth. Sealed like a wax ring, a decree, an official decree from on high which cannot be broken. He sealed this as a curse and a blessing that we can count on. And it can't fail. He sealed it with them when he took them out of the land of Egypt. If you want to know what covenant deal Israel has with Yahuwah, you've got to go back to the event coming out of Egypt. You can't look 2,000 years later at the Christian New Testament and think that's the covenant. That's the cherry on top going into eternal life. But that's not the same thing as going back to the terms of the covenant, which is the 22 letters of the Palo Hebrew alphabet, as we pointed out yesterday. That is the covenant. So, this is what they did. This is what our forefathers did. They went and served the gods of others and prostrated themselves to them. The gods that they knew not and he did not apportion to them. The gods, the word gods is Elohim, which is powers. The powers that he did not apportion to his people. We were talking yesterday about a certain woman here in these hills which invokes the name of the Jesus man but uses powers and authorities that Yahuwah did not apportion to his people. 
I read a couple books lately. Matrix Energetics by Richard Bartlett, Healing Codes by Dr. Alexander Lloyd, and both of them recently, here's 2018, within the past 10 years, have found very effective protocols to manifest healings. One is from a Christian point of view, Alex Lloyd. The other one is from a shaman point of view, Richard Bartlett. They won't tell you that right up front. If you read enough in, through the books, you'll, uh, you'll surmise that. They finally kind of tip their hand three, four, five hundred pages into the text. The point is this. I'm not going to berate them, but what I'm saying is they indeed are manifesting healings. You hold your hands up, you, 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 you picture the same, blah, 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 and pretty, the cancers will fall off. Lou Gehrig's disease healed. Sanity brought back. Traumas that where people have spent thousands of dollars going to all kinds of counselors for decades and suddenly their mind is clear. And it doesn't just happen if you agree or have some placebo or really muster your energy to, to, to comprehend it. You can do this protocol and a dog's leg will be healed. And uh, somebody had stepped on their pet lizard's head and crushed it and the lizard came back fully, fully restored within hours. Manifest healings like crazy. How is that so? What is going on? There's a verse in scripture that says, if they speak not according to the Torah and the testimony, there is no light in them. So here's what's going on. Yahweh built the universe according to a structure. Quantum physics basically is this, from my understanding. There's wood. That's made out of a tree. A tree is made out of the same thing as all organic matter, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, C-H-O-N. Okay, what are those? Those are elements. They form together compounds. They, they take on physical form. Well, what's in an element? Electrons and protons. What are electrons made out of? Quarks. What holds the quarks together? Gluons. What are gluons made out of? Nobody knows, but they guess, they surmise, they kind of picture uh, they pretend that they're strings which wiggle. St string theory. What are the strings made out? No mass, no substance. It's information. Information wiggles, which causes us to see all this. Now, I did a video a few, I'm not just in the interest of time, I won't go there exactly right this minute, but it's called String Theory, Quantum Physics, and the Virgin Birth, or the Alphabet and Virgin Birth. The Alphabet is a string of letters, 22 letters long. The ruach, the word ruach, means an expanse, an extent. This building goes from here to there. Okay, I see that. If I'm going to measure it, I can put it into meters, millimeters, feet, yards. I can choose the classification, but the expanse from here to there is actually called the ruach. And if I lift up that and, and make it wider or allow the wind to come in, the wind coming from this fan is also called ruach. Ruach, by definition, is mind expanse from here to there and you can measure it Ruach it's not written up here from Aleph to Tav is the Ruach of Elohim it's the Ruach HaKodesh the alphabet is the Holy Spirit if you put it in those words but as soon as you say that it's <laughs> something doesn't fit the Ruach HaKodesh is the expanse from Aleph to Tav that Yahweh determined was his mind, his heart, put on display for all of us, plug it into John 1.1, 1, 1. he took that word, I believe it was the Hebrew alphabet, and through which he made the entire physical universe. How? Go back to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth, Aleph Tov, the heavens and the earth, Bereshit Baralohim, Et, Aleph Tov, Hashemayim Ve'et Ha'aretz. The Aleph Tov is that word by which everything was created. And the earth was without form and void, in other words, nothing had started wiggling. There was no wiggling string yet. There was a string, but it wasn't wiggling yet. Therefore, you got no gluons, quarks, electrons, protons, elements. Then remember what happened? The Ruach Elohim Merachefet al Pnei Hamaya. It started wiggling. Merahefet is translated flutter or hover. How do you hover? Like a hummingbird. That's the original oscillation. That's why waves wiggle. That's why light waves oscillate. Or somebody says, well, they're not really oscillating, they're pulsating. Either way, it's that plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus rhythmic heartbeat 
So Yahweh's telling us right there, if we can read the words, that he invented the wiggling string, the Hebrew alphabet, and started wiggling it, merahephet, which is the ruach, and here we have that string theory. Okay, that's what holds everything together. So if somebody's ill, like we prayed for John last night, expect to see that, that ugly cauliflower laying on the floor this morning, but nope, it's still got its uh, octopus arms holding onto his neck, but... Uh, Maybe we should try that uh, two-point technique that Richard Bartley was talking about. Maybe that would work. Maybe we should get some uh, special herbs and uh, chant some certain things like uh, that other lady was talking about. Maybe what we should do is throw some, some girl into the volcano. Maybe that would take... Maybe what we should do, uh, like Alexander Lloyd discovered because God downloaded it to him, that he holds his hands like this and he says a certain paragraph of praying to God and inviting the light, life, and love of God and releasing it to happen. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Did Yahweh apportion that stuff to us? Because they forsook the covenant of Yahweh. It's not about that other stuff. Those nations can do it. Get a totem pole. You know, get a tinkling bells and... Ribbon, it's not, a, not that there's anything wrong with bells and ribbons, but what I'm saying is they forsook the covenant. What covenant? Going back to the paleo tells you the covenant because every letter is one of the aspects of the covenant. You learn the letters, you learn the covenant. That's what it is, every single letter. He sealed with them when he took them out of the land of Egypt. They went and served the gods of others, prostrated themselves to them. Gods they knew not that he did not apportion them. So Elohim's anger flared against the land not just against the people, Yahweh desecrated the land to bring upon it the entire curse that's written in the book. When he says it, he means it. And Yahweh removed them from upon their soil with anger, wrath, and great fury, and he cast them to another land as this very day. And this place right here, Cherokee County in the United States, is one of the other places that Yahweh cast them, but he didn't stop the anger and great wrath he said in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, he'd chase him with the sword and pestilence and plague and wild animals and enemies and on and on. The hidden are for or unto Yahweh or Elohim. In other words, if he didn't reveal it, it's none of our business. We don't have to worry about it. It just doesn't matter. But the revealed, remember that word, Petoff, the, the things that he opens in his words are for us and our children. Lenu velobeno. It's got dots above it. That's another thing. It's one of the jots and tittles. Forever, forever, forever. Not just 2000 BC or 1500 BC, but here we are to carry out all the words of this Torah. Then, Deuteronomy 30. It will be, it will be. Just like he didn't relent in bringing the curse, he won't relent in bringing the healing. It will be that when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse I have presented before you, this is, the, this is the protocol. Then you will take it to your heart among the nations where Yahweh Elohim has dispersed you, and you will return unto Yahweh Elohim, listen to his voice, according to everything that I command you today, that's this day, Deuteronomy 30, it wasn't nailed to the cross and done away with. It's still active and effective. You and your children with all your heart and all your soul, then, promise, then, decree, his signet ring that can't be broken. Yahweh your Elohim will bring back your captivity and have mercy upon you and he will gather you in from the peoples to which Yahweh your Elohim has scattered you. It doesn't matter about our ancient history. What Native American tribe, what European nation, culture, bloodline, genealogy, which of the 12 tribes are you from, that's not what's important. What's important is... What's in front of us? Bringing us back to his covenant as an achad, or yichad, in that case, yod katada, a yichad people balanced with his authority ruling, dominating. This is, this is Deuteronomy 30. He will do tov, good to you. If you're dispersed, will be at the ends of the heaven from which, from there Yahweh Elohim will gather you in, and from there he will take you. Has this happened? We're still on the other side of the earth. Has this verse happened? Then it's not the end of the world. 
Don't be afraid that this is the end of the world. Since I was a kid, we've been told this is the last generation, the end of the world. It is not, because this hasn't happened. Yahweh your Elohim will bring you to the land that your forefathers possessed, and you will possess it. As far as I can tell, this is the land of Israel over there in the Middle East. Other people think it's America. Whatever. Different story. He will do good to you, Tov, and make you more numerous than your forefathers. That same word numerous can also mean increase your regard of value. We think, gosh, Moshe, what a great man. Joshua, David, whew, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's saying here that he will increase our regard to be greater than that of those men. You will be considered to be greater than Sarah and Rebecca. That was not the high point, the heyday. What's in front of us is, if we come back to these words, but if we say, how did the Cree, the Cherokee, the Sioux, how did the uh, Polynesians, how did the, uh, how did the Eskimos, how did the Incas and the Aztecs, how did they worship their Elohims? Don't go there. No, wrong, out of bounds. It'll bring the curse back. Don't even think that those guys were given information that we should tap into. Sorry, Richard Bartlett. Sorry, Alex Lloyd. It's in the Torah of Yahuwah. And whether we see something fall off a guy's neck or not doesn't change the reality. The only answer is to go back to the words of this Torah. Verse 7, chapter 30, Deuteronomy. Yahweh your Elohim will place... Back up. Yahweh your Elohim will circumcise your heart. That means remove the barrier of what's been obstructing this to find his stuff favorable. And the heart of your offspring as to love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart and all your soul that you may live. He says with all your heart and all your soul I think half a dozen times here. Remember that song? Dun, 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 dun. Heart and soul? It's all about Deuteronomy 30. Yahweh your Elohim Verse 7, will place all these curses, these imprecations, upon your enemies. And those who hate you, who pursued you, he's going to tip the scales the other direction. By his authority, when we balance the scales of having a love for his word. But if we've been given the wrong translation of his word, so that we think it was nailed to the cross, or that we don't love it, we have to choose to love it. And then by being, put your beanie on and look at the words and then the heart that Sally was expressing, that you could see the, the, the tenderness because her heart has been circumcised and the barrier against this stuff has been removed. And so the, the communication, the relationship is real. It's alive. It's not an invention. And Richard Bartlett will tell you when he's saying, oh, this works, look at this. He says, but I'm making it up. It's all an imagination. A hologram of Superman, a hologram of a mouse telling them what to do, but sometimes they lie to you, so you got to be careful. And it's like, what? <laughs> Those are the spirit guides that are telling them how to do this stuff. We don't need that. Truth, infallible, Yahweh's word. But you got to know how to read his words to open up the meaning of the words in order to do it. Return to the words, that, the commandments and decrees. Verse Chapter 30, verse 30, verse 10. When you listen to the voice of Yahweh Elohim to observe His commands and His decrees, observe His commands and decrees that are written in this book of the Torah, when you shall return to Yahweh Elohim with all your heart and all your soul. Okay, verse 10 of chapter 30. When you listen to the voice of Yahweh to observe His commands and His decrees. So, I go to verse 10. The word is chok. And Zadi Vav Tov. Now here, the mitzvah. Here's the two words. He, this is the thing. You want two things? The two hands of the two-point thing? Here. Mem Zadi Vav Tov. M T Z V T. Mitzvot. It's also where you get the word matzah, which is Mem Zadi Hey, which literally is that thing that you eat unleavened bread for a week, and it means find out how to do something. The word matzah literally means to find out. So, here, I, I just want to show you something really critical here, what Jesse was saying yesterday. The word is matzot and chokti. So, het kuf tav. Het kuf tav. That's a suffix. Bob tav is a suffix. Mem is the place of. So, here's what we say. Remember what Jesse said, line upon line, precept upon precept. 
and I was saying that the Zadi is a picture of the resurrection, and the Kuf is the ascension, but Zadi also is the one letter which represents his scepter of authority, which is Matzah, which is the commandments that he told us, you want to find out how to do something? Look at my commandments. He already gave us the answer to everything. It was nailed to the cross, it was buried, done away with, but it'll resurrect when we have the right heart and soul. Our attitude will cause a change in the quantum mechanics of the entire universe just because we apply our heart with intent. All your heart, all your soul affects the very fabric of the entire universe. And then when you apply your words, that's a whole other thing. Het ku. Okay, so here in the alphabetic progression, the letter het, our letter H, is the eighth letter. And the letter Zadi was the sprout back to life. And the letter Kuf, in modern Hebrew it's written like that because it stands up above the other letters. It was like the, the, the pillar of fire, pillar of smoke. Our letter Q, Het is a fence. Here's like the Mesh Mishkan fence. I'm drawing it as a rectangle because the circle thing is another matter. But uh, And the Kuf is this cloud, his presence over his camp. So the picture of the word het and kuf is the mishkan of Yahweh with his people camped around it. And the word mishkan means place of dwelling. And his presence was over it like a dome of clouds. It, it, it's veritably a picture of a treasure box. But this word is commandment. <laughs> the treasure box of Yahweh is in commandments. And the letter het lines up with Pesach. And the letter Zadi lines up with Shemini Yatzeret, the, the eighth day of Sukkot, and all the Moadim are in the pattern between Het and Zadi. So basically, the treasure box is in the Moadim. And for Constantine to say they're illegal, you can't keep them, Yahweh allowed or told Constantine to steal the treasure box with the formula for all health and all sanity and the restoration of the entire planet and hide it away, making it illegal. And for so for 2,000 years, the Christians have been praying, and they've had no access. And the Jews had it, but hey, everybody thinks the Jews are going to burn in hell, so why do you want to do what they're doing? And so they've kept it, and whatever's happened with the rabbinical stuff is a different matter, but this stuff has been out of bounds for all these years. And so when we look around and say, well, where's something that works effectively? Oh, uh, matrix energetics. Um, healing codes, uh, say this thing to some phantom nameless god. It's not some phantom nameless god. It's Yahweh Eloheinu, according to the protocols of the Torah. But then you'll get some people, sorry Matthew Nolan, but they'll say that the book of the Torah was leaned up against the Ark of the Covenant as a witness against us. Bad laws that nobody can do. Sorry, not true. Ezekiel 20:24. 20, is not talking about the bad laws of the book of the Torah that nobody can do. Yahweh kicked us out of the land and sent us to be dispersed, <coughs> dispersed among the lands of our enemies who put their laws on upon us that are bad laws that nobody can live by. I disagree that it's the book of the Torah that are the bad laws that we can't live by. We were told that to keep the curse sustained all these years. These things are detestable. Read Leviticus 26. Yahweh says, if you find my decrees, my Zadok and my Kuf, line upon line, precept upon precept, if you find them to be testable, abhorrent, loathsome, or even if you, whatever, have a casual disregard, then I'm going to deal with you with a fury of casual disregard. And I'm going to call in the animals and the insects and the plagues and the pestilence and the enemies with their swords and their GMOs and their chemtrails and their Monsantos and uh, the laws. And they'll steal your land and lie to you and break treaties. That's what's been happening. Whoa, gee, take a look. When all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse, as I prophesied, and we are standing here at the vantage point of overlooking it all, that's the Khufu. We're standing here at the Kuf, overlooking the entire array of life on earth in the last 3,000 years, 3,500 years. And he says, okay, return to me with all your heart and soul. Listen to the words of this Torah and do them. That's why we're here at Sukkot. That's why we don't work on Shabbat. That's why we don't eat the unclean foods. Because we're simply returning to him with all our heart, 
so that he, Yahweh Rafeno, Yahweh who heals us, will and can indeed heal us. Because if we have an unbalanced scale, he can't. His kingdom doesn't work that way. You're saying whoop you do What? <laughs> That's all you would get is a whoop you do How about a hooray, hallelujah, thank you, Yahweh. <laughs> Give thanks to Yahweh for his goodness. Kileolam, forever, without end. It's not a contract covenant nailed to the cross. Without end, his chesed, chazdo, tender, loving kindness. He has been waiting for this for thousands of years. Yahweh. Adam blew it, the people up until Noah, and then right out of the gate with Noah, then you get Nimrod, and all those guys blew it, and then you get bringing the, the nation, and those guys blew it, and then he gave it to David, there was a glint, a glimmer, and then Solomon, it crashed and burned, Yeshua came, and then boom, it crashed again, and right after, here we are, Yahweh has never yet had his dream come true, oh, I will be your Elohim, and you will be my people, and then I'm going to turn and smack down your enemies, the ones who have been chasing you, Hasn't happened, but here we are. This is not the time to turn to phantom angels and masters of, of, of spiritual guides and think that if we just knew the right saying, if we just had the right potion formula of incense, if we just had the right brand of feather. It's not about that. It's not about that. But it is about these words. And it's not about, oh, if you have the right orthography, is this a kuf? Or is this a kuf? Or is that a kuf? Or is, uh, uh, is this a kuf? It's what the letter means. It's Yeshua in the letters who sets the standard of what every letter means. And the kuf is, the same way he lifted up, he's coming back. But he was a prototype of Israel. Israel is sent into dispersion, and Israel's coming back. If we die and go to the grave, we'll resurrect. It's all these things. It's not which one of them is the real kuf. It's all these things. And all the letters have all those aspects. And so when you learn them and see them, you can look at any word and your heart will gush. Just like sounds or mine. Or a few other people that can see this. Anybody else want to say or contribute to this? Shalom. Until next time. Can you put all that into one word? Rejoice! <laughs> Sameach! And, and what you were just saying about how he has elevated his word for all these words and commandments that are called instruction or truths. Yes. Covering. Yes. The, it is his name. That guy they call it Yahweh, just just, just for what it's worth, there's some talk going on on the internet that the name Yahweh is some, I think it's from Canaan or Egypt, is some pagan deity. And so a bunch of people say, yeah, forget the name. And it's like, we're going to get into Exodus 3 next time. He declared his name. If somebody else wants to run with it, like from what I understand, witches keep the Saturday, seventh day Sabbath because they know there's some power or something going on. That doesn't mean just, just because some witch determines to keep the seventh day Sabbath and nobody else came because now it's been polluted. So somebody else thinks, oh, the name Yahweh, and they happen to be a pagan. If they don't get it, what you're saying, you think you got the name. It's not about the pronunciation of the name. It's the, the guy that Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, who they identified by the name. It's the guy who has this Aleph Tav as his Shem. It's that Yahweh. It's not the guy that has the name that sounds like it. So the difference between Jesus and Yeshua, in my estimation, just for what it's worth, Jesus is the Christian guy that, that nailed this stuff to the cross and teaches his followers to have no regard of them. Yeshua is the guy that's these 22 letters incarnate and who teaches the Torah that we should return to with all our heart and soul. That's the only difference. It's not about the magic way to say his name. So knowing him, knowing the Aleph Tov, that's what it's about.
and then aligning with that with all our heart and all our soul, and then the expectation, the chuf, the kufa is literally hope, tikva, it's the hope set before you to see manifest exactly what we just read in Deuteronomy 29.30. Our hope energizes what he said was going to happen, so that's where the, the quantum physics of the universe come in that we'll get to on the next level, saying, as we set our sight and our heart to hope for what he said to hope for, which includes the healing of Yahweh Rapha, it changes the structure of the elements at the level of not just the electrons, but the energy that causes the electrons, which goes back to the Hebrew alphabet, the wiggling string that holds everything together. It's amazing stuff. Now we're at the end. <laughs>